I want you all to get comfortable because we're going to start using our imaginations for the next 10 minutes. Is that okay? Everyone's cool with that? We're going to use our imaginations a little bit? Okay, good. I want you to imagine that the next 10 minutes is like a story in a book, and this book has yet to be published. So picture it as a draft of sorts. When I'm finished in 10 minutes, all of us collectively will figure out if this book should be published. So get loose, open the mind, breathe in and out. Are we ready? Okay. You sure? Okay. Okay, so the story starts something like this. A 19-year-old young man who has never met a Muslim in his life and knows practically nothing about Islamic traditions enrolls in a Islam 101 college course with a hope of being an intelligence officer. The young man is not a complete Islamophobe, but let's just say he had some pretty questionable ideas and thoughts. On the first day of this Islam 101 class, the young man enters the classroom to see an older professor, a brown man, an immigrant, and someone who identifies himself as a Muslim. Now remember, for this young man, this was effectively the first Muslim that he had ever met in his entire life. As Islam 101 proceeds, the Muslim professor starts to rock this young man's heart, his mind, and his soul by showing, showing him a side of Islam and Muslims that is never seen in the media. As the months and years progress, the Muslim prof professor welcomes the young man into his small circle of researchers. And over the years, the Muslim professor continues to influence the young man's personal, professional, and spiritual growth. This Muslim professor even takes the young man on countless journeys across our beautiful country, the United States, in order to improve relations between all the people who call this country home. Throughout their travels together, the professor and his student journey into the homes, the places of worship, the schools, the businesses, and the neighborhoods of Americans of all walks of life. The Muslim professor even introduces the young man to some of the most brilliant minds in the country, including Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Noam Chomsky. The young man would never have been able to participate in any of these travels if it were not for a generous $15,000 grant from a Muslim organization in the middle of New Mexico. It was certainly a generous gift, and the young man was thankful. But the journey of this young man with his Muslim professor was not always smooth sailing. One time, the young man was assaulted in Washington, D.C. He was smashed in the face with a pint glass and suffered facial injuries that required two surgeries, which was followed by another plastic surgery. The doctor who put this young man's face back together just happened to be Muslim. The young man had another life-threatening experience on this journey in Hollywood, which is not too far away. He was at the home of a Muslim businessman to screen the documentary that he and the professor were working on. Within five minutes of the screening, an unexpected allergic reaction occurred, and the young man had to be rushed to the hospital. And guess who took care of the young man at the hospital? A Muslim. At this time in his life, as a 22-year-old living off a small grant, the young man had absolutely no health insurance. As you know, having astronomical health care bills and no, uh, with no health insurance is certainly a recipe for disaster. But what happened next was a beautiful act of charity. The host of the film screening, the Muslim businessman, covered the bills of the young man because this Muslim man was passionate about helping those in need. Now, everyone's still with me? 
Our imagination's still open, good. Eventually, this young man decides to clip his wings, and he decides that he needs to journey without his Muslim professor as his guide. The young man decides to move to Europe, where he reaches out to Muslim communities of all backgrounds in the hope that he could meet with them for research purposes. And they end up welcome, welcoming him with open arms. Over the, young, over the years, the young man dines with Muslims, prays with them, dialogues with them, laughs with them, cries with them, marches with them, studies with them, and travels with them. Together, they collectively experience the joys and the struggles that are so common among all human beings. One particular family became like family to the young man. He spent countless hours in their restaurant and their mosque. He learns about the dynamics of their culture and their unique Islamic practices, which reminded him of his own ethnic and religious backgrounds. The young man grew to not see these Muslims as research objects or participants, but rather as fellow human beings who have a wealth of knowledge about our creator and ideas on how to contribute to the betterment of our communities. Upon his return to the United States, the young man takes up a position at a university where he decides to teach a class called Muslims in American Society. In this course, the man brings countless, of number, uh, countless numbers of Muslims to the classrooms who happen to be community leaders, activists, imams, athletes, and so on. The students in the course interact with the Muslim communities around them, and these students introduce the man, who is no longer particularly young, to many more Muslims who further enrich his lived experience. The draft of this book stops here, at least for now. Perhaps you haven't figured it out by now, but if not, the young man in the story is me. These stories, these stories, believe it or not, really did happen. And the Muslims discussed here have actual names, faces, and stories of their own. You see, my work as an educator, a scholar, a public in intellectual, or whatever you want to identify me as, is simply not possible and nor were any of the previous experiences that I mentioned possible without the selfless, selfless contribution of Muslims. Now think about this. If it were not for the Muslim professor, I would have never fallen in love with knowledge. If it were not for the grant of the Muslim organization in New Mexico, I would have never traveled throughout my country to learn about Islam and US national identity. If it were not for the Muslim businessman in Hollywood who paid my hospital bills, I could be buried in debt. If it were not for the Muslim family, I would never have completed my studies. If it were not for the Muslim surgeon in Washington, DC, I could have a mangled face. And if it were not for the Muslim doctor in Hollywood who dealt with my allergic reaction, well, I may not even be here. Quite simply, Muslims are part of who I am and who I wish to be. They are my past and they are my future. They are my family, they are my mentors, my role models, my friends, and most importantly, my brothers and sisters in humanity. And for all of us here tonight, each and every one of us, Muslims are our school teachers, professors, doctors, lawyers, charitable givers, students, community activists, entrepreneurs, bus drivers, cab drivers, secretaries, social problems workers, psychiatrists, athletes, artists, musicians, bankers, public intellectuals, political figures, politicians, and so on. In short, Muslims in the United States contribute everywhere to everyone and to every realm of American society. They truly make our country go round. Now that you've heard about these personal experiences and views, let me point out that these personal experiences do not exist in isolation from my scholarship and the books that I have published. When I see a poll in the media that says US Muslims are highly educated, I naturally think of all the Muslims and the teachers who have guided me and continue to inspire me to gain more knowledge. 
When I see statistics that reveal that U.S. Muslims believe in freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, I naturally think about my friends who speak about their appreciation of the U.S. Constitution and the rights that they provide. When I see a book that highlights Prophet Muhammad's love of humanity and vision for a pluralist world, I reflect on the panel events that I have sat on with Muslims who also speak about the Prophet's greatness. And when I see news stories on interfaith relations, on Muslims standing arm in arm with other communities who are also facing difficult circumstances, I am reminded of the times that I locked arms with Muslims on the streets. So the findings and the conclusions of all of these various academic studies do not merely exist as theories or abstract ideas. They are real life. They are facts. People like myself and so many others recognize the contributions of Muslims because they have experienced them at interfaith gatherings, the vigils, the hospitals, the schools, the businesses, the community centers, the grocery stores, the places of worship, Hub 925, and so on. People in this country feel the contributions of Muslims in the lovely emails or text exchanges, the hugs, the collective tears, the social media posts of solidarity, and even the common greetings of peace that we hear so often on a daily basis. So when we consider our lived experiences, at least in the context of what I have just shared with you, we see stories of humanity, compassion, tolerance, pluralism, civic values, mercy, thoughtfulness, solidarity, belonging, inclusion, diversity, and community building. These are the kind of values that can transform our country, but also our very existence as human beings here on Earth. These are the stories that are worth telling, and as such, they are certainly the stories that are worth publishing. Now, to return to what I said at the beginning, is this book worth publishing? I think so.